What's up people, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Rebranding Safety is the YouTube channel and podcast doing exactly what it says on the tin. We're here to rebrand health and safety. So welcome back to the podcast if you're new here. Today we're talking all about health because it's part two of the health mini series. Let's jump into the intro and then we'll talk more about health. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution and one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviors. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety, crushing the stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Fluid. What's up guys, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. If you're new here and you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss another episode if you're all listen to us on itunes you know when you finish please don't forget to give us a little rate and review we would absolutely love you for that 100 percent if you're on spotify hit follow or any of those buttons that are there look remotely positive give us a press because you know it's all just good stuff man this is episode two of the health mini series. We're talking all about health and well-being in this kind of this 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 mini series. And today we're talking to Carla Crocom, who I've known for quite a while actually. Um, she used to be the I think she was the head of safety, if I remember rightly, at a local training center that I used to partner with at a old 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 employer of mine. As we work out that it was seven years ago, which is just nuts so i mean we talk about loads in this stuff carla runs uh two awesome businesses health rocks and safety rocks um you know she's that kind of traditional health and safety professional um background but done like work all around the world done some amazing stuff but now she's got this mad passion for health like absolutely mad for it and so knowledgeable around the stuff as well. So we get into loads of stuff around like how you have to kind of tweak your diet for each individual person. Um, you know, that kind of average generic advice doesn't work, which is just fascinating. We talk about like veganism, vegetarianism, we talk about meat eating, we talk about absolutely everything, personal diets. So then we talk about like business stuff as well and how businesses can help drive people's health and well-being and how that can be a benefit to the business and your legal duties around that and absolutely loads and loads of stuff. Um, you know, it's really interesting that we've had our, to use Carla's words, we've had our mortality in our face for the first time ever. Um, and I really do think, me personally, you know, I've taken a real critical look at my health and well-being now, um, particularly my mental well-being. Um, you know, I haven't got the best health and I definitely don't have the best mental well-being. Um, but it, it's it's interesting because... I haven't always been really unfit or really kind of really fit. I'm always kind of balanced in the middle. I'm I'm I have a balance in the middle and I have peaks either side. That's that's kind of my life journey through it. Um, so you know, it's interesting now when we see this virus for the first time. You know, really in my lifetime we've had something like this in the UK, um, and I, and it's it's really hit home. So I really hope that you guys kind of find some. Some, something useful in this health and well-being mini-series and I really think you can hopefully take something away to start looking after yourself because I think you've got to look after yourself if you want to go to work and look after people and what we're all trying to do every single day as safety professionals or business owners we're trying to help people we're trying to keep people safe we're trying to you know provide for people for our jobs whatever we're all you know give 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 so many of us we do so much for other people and sometimes we forget to think about ourselves so I hope you can take something away from this mini series to help yourself. Um, one final thing from me, I would absolutely love it. Go to www.rebrandingsafety.com. That's our merch store. You can buy a sweatshirt, a t-shirt, a mug, a tote bag. You can get any of that stuff for very reasonable prices. And then send us the order. Bing, we send it over to our distributor, our manufacturer, who's a lovely lady based in Kettering, uh, which is local to me. And she'll 
do a thing, do a magic, send it over to you. It all looks wicked and it's not obvious that you're uh, supporting a health and safety podcast either. I don't think so anyway. I think it's genuinely quite stylish. Um, so go check them out, please. And if you do, take a selfie with you holding it or wearing it, whatever you buy, and tweet us on Safety Rebranded or hit us up on LinkedIn or Facebook on Rebranded Safety as well and let us know uh, because we would love to see you in our merch, 100%. Don't forget www.rebrandedsafety.com. Go and get some merch. Without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Carla Crocom. Hello, Carla. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, James. Thank you for having me. That's okay. Thank you for coming on. Why don't you give us a quick introduction to yourself? I've known you for quite, quite a while now and stalked you on LinkedIn, but obviously uh, some, of, uh, some other people might not have uh, known you for so long. So why don't you give us an introduction to yourself and, and also like a brief, let's just go with a brief introduction to Safety Rocks because I think we'll end up talking about Health Rocks, which is your other business, quite a lot in this anyway because you're going to talk about health today. So yeah. So go, you go from there, take it away. Just funny. That's the funniest introduction. You know, stalking people. It's quite funny. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't uh, do the old uh, full list of, of uh, <laughs> achievements and stuff. Nah, I just come in and I tell you whether I've been stalking you or not. If I've been stalking you, that's a life achievement. <laughs> Woo-hoo, I feel blessed. <laughs> uh, so my name is Carla Crocom, um, and I head up a company called Safety Rocks, and I've spent over twenty years in the health and safety industry, both in the UK and also abroad, on some really exciting projects including um, working on a power station, being in South Africa, working for the Health Protection Agency and a whole variety of different organisations. Um, and uh, one of the things I think is really interesting about safety is that through the time that I've been doing the job I've realised that sometimes the problem with the industry is that it has a reputation for being real dull and really boring. Let's face it James you know that um, and so consequently that can genuinely commercial like, hinder commercial activity it stops businesses working effectively and actually that's not what our job's about is it we're not supposed to be police people we're supposed to be um, facilitating people to manage risk and so as you probably guessed I'm neither dull nor boring (laughs) and I am incredibly passionate about the subject of health and safety and particularly around things like health I just think we've got a lot of work to do in the UK so fundamentally I believe that it's all about influencing people um, and trying to get people to do things by by influencing the way they think. So we educate people, inform them, and basically try and get them to change their minds about things rather than telling them what they can and can't do. I think if we give people education, we've got a major capacity to be able to get them on board and motivate them to do Mm. things really well. Um, And so, uh, you know, as a company, I think when I founded it, I I wanted to build long term partnerships with clients, which enabled kind of a deeper understanding of their culture. You know, we we were talking before we we started the podcast about culture. Culture is fundamentally important in businesses and it's become more important than ever now in the virtual world that we're living in currently. Um, Mm. And so it's getting under the skin of organizations, finding out what they do before we even talk about things like training. So then we're looking at. Um, not giving them off the shelf tailored you know solutions rather we're tailoring them so we're we're not giving them off the shelf training solutions to try and uh, fit a square peg into a round hole we're trying to give them training solutions that fit their organization that enable them to achieve their objectives so I will say off the shelf training is off the table it's all about Mm -hmm. truly tailored solutions for people so influencing them by trying to inform them and educating people so uh, yeah that's what it's all about and and you know, when I worked in the training industry, it, there are a lot of companies that do the whole kind of, you know, um, off, you know, off the shelf jobbies. Um, mm. And sometimes it just doesn't fit with organizations. So that was the idea of starting the company five years ago. Can you believe five <laughs> years ago? It flies. It literally flies. So, it yeah, it's amazing. It doesn't isn't even it? feel that long ago when uh, I think the business I worked for had a partnership with the training company that you work for and, and we'd come to like a, a meeting and, and you were giving your, 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 your kind of speech about the partnership and that and talking about and that doesn't feel that long ago if I'm honest and that must have been well it must have been over five years ago I think it was about seven years ago Jesus Which- Christ is amazing i mean and when i say oh i've been doing like in safety in one shape or form for about 20 years even for Mm. me i kind of go 
goodness me, that's a long time. You know, <laughs> I recently did a blog for Nebosh about safety careers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when, when I, even when I say that, I think, wow, where has all that time gone? It just goes yeah. ever so quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, that was when I worked for the, the last organization that I worked for that I met you there. Yeah. It is amazing. Um, you know, you know that the whole thing about the health bit as well. So safety and health, health and safety, it always gets talked about together. Um, mm -hmm. And the major focus about Safety Rocks was setting it up so that we could deliver tailored training solutions to companies around safety. But quickly, when you look at the data, the statistics that are out there, actually in the UK, we don't do such a bad job with reference to safety. It's getting better. Uh, the awareness is better, but safety is more how can I say more in your face than health? Health is underlying, you know, we were talking about it's mental visual, health. Yeah, you know, if you don't put a guard on a saw, you might cut your arm off, you know, that kind mm. of thing. It's pretty obvious, but mental health issues, not so obvious. Uh, problems with, you know, not looking after ourselves, even things like problems with hearing, uh, breathing, um, even neurological conditions, you know, they're not very obvious for us to see. So, um, I, I set up kind of health rocks to as a brand underneath uh, safety rocks okay. um, in order to try and look at that health aspect so mm. the hsc they do their statistics every year don't they they, they launch their they you do. know their statistics data and when you look at that you you can see that every year there are around 28.5 million working days lost you know 2018 2019 mm -hmm. you know um when you look at that the majority of those working days lost they're not to safety they're to do with health Mm. So uh, when, I, when I last looked at the last figures, it was 23.5 million working days were lost to ill health and the rest was safety out of that 28.5 million. So, you know, you look at that and you think, wow, we, we got a big job to do with health. Yeah. And, and what do you think, James? Do you think that companies really uh, invest in their, in their employees' health? I mean, we have the whole... You know, as an organisation, we have to look at after our health, uh, health and safety of our work workers, and as far as reasonably practicable, you know, whilst they're at work, the health, safety, and welfare aspect. Do you think that health is is something that gets dealt with holistically? Mm. I think it is. I think I interviewed um, I interviewed Dr. Dominic Cooper on when did I interview him on Monday, and yes. he. It's quite controversial in in some in some of the areas where he's very passionate and one of the things he is probably most passionate about is should the question should health and safety professionals be dealing with mental health well-being etc and he's of the opinion no and he said something which i've been probably toying with for a long time he said in health and safety i think we do a lot of things bad instead of a few things good and I thought that was quite interesting. And, and, I'm, and then it made me think, and this is how my brain works, uh, which is like hectic. Anyone that just listens to the podcast are like, we, we know James. Um, but it, it made me think about, I went to a, um, uh, like a it, was a, it was a stress and well-being day uh, put on by principal people, one of, the, one of the main kind of specialist recruiters for health and safety. And it was part of their, um, their program, Safety for Good. Um, which is just an amazing, it's a charity essentially, and it's, they're doing some amazing work. But anyway, um, they did this day on mental health and had this gentleman on who was a head of health and safety. And he talked very candidly about his, ex his own personal mental health experiences. And one of my yeah. questions at the end of it, which, which sparked a bit of a debate in the room actually, um, which is always good. Um, but it was, should health and safety professionals be, be dealing with this stuff? Like really, should we be, given our opinions on how to manage mental health i am not a psychologist and and i don't feel like i'm in the position to really manage mental health within my business and probably the wider sectors of health what the broader kind of areas that health covers to a good job i think i i'm quite passionate about mental health anyway so i think yes. my passion would probably help me however my concern is, am I doing a good enough job? So I think there's a lot of health and safety professionals out there that will do it and probably do it quite well. But I think if, you, if I was to answer your question, what's my stance on it? I think we need to be very 
we need to be very clear on our own capabilities of health and safety generalists, which is what we originally were, or how I would kind of call us, we're, we're risk experts, that's all we are. We're, we're experts on managing risk and, and interpreting technical support. That's a key thing, is, is understanding our capabilities and highlighting when we need technical support. So going to people and saying, right, you're a mental health expert, I need your help now. So that's a really that's interesting chance. point. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point, what you said. And also talking about, you know, Dominic saying that, you know, health and safety people tend to do a lot of things not very well. Mm. Um, knowing knowing your limitations is really quite important. And we're always taught that, aren't we? We're from, a, from a very low point in our health and safety training, we're always taught about learning our own limitations. Um, all very important. Um, in terms of mental health, you just get in the people, I think, as professionals, you get a team around you of people who spend specialize in things and the same thing happens when you run an organization so uh, like for example when when we are going out and doing days with health rocks we we cover things like nutrition um, injury prevention weight management and things like mental health but you bring in we bring in personal trainers you know we, and, and they do exercise programs with people and then you know we talk about nutrition with people um, and you know all those kind of things but it depends on your specialist areas doesn't it we all as safety professionals have specialist things that we really love um and that we um, tend to be better at than other things um so it's focusing on those and then as an organization getting in people who are specialists in other areas so we do that a lot as a company so we'll mm. join up and partnership with people and i i'm one of those people who say actually that person's better at teaching that than me i'll send them in and and i think it's really important that we do that as a profession Definitely. that we don't have health and safety managers in companies who are in isolation and they actually don't have a team mm. um, and then you basically ask them to do everything so if you're asking a health and safety manager uh, to do uh, i don't know um, stuff on uh, just you know dangerous substances in one breath and then asking them to do a presentation on nutrition in the other breath as long as they are qualified in those areas and know enough about those subjects then that's fine but most don't most are not as broadly diverse in that respect as individuals so i actually do think that that actually that is a really valid point Mm. um it but we also know that we can develop and grow as individuals so mm. i am really passionate about health i'm really passionate particularly about things like weight management and nutrition and i think it has a massive impact on our mental health um i had a conversation um with somebody who is a psychologist like you did talking about the role of nutrition in people's mental health uh, the role of mm. sleep you know the role of exercise all of that has an impact um, and so we will all have our own specialist areas but we can get other people to help us and that kind of network of people and and that's what building the business was all about is having a network of really competent really brilliant people who will work together who all have different skills i mean you and i were talking about the book you know we've talked about matthew syed and all, all mm. the kind of rebel thinking um, and looking at um you know people joining together who are different but all also have same kind of end game the end goal is definitely there we're all different but we all have different skills so it is yeah. that having a diverse network of people who you can draw upon so if a client asks for something we can fulfill that requirement but using different people so it wouldn't be i'm just going to be me it's going to be me that's going to be pitching, pitching <laughs> up all the time because that's not actually necessarily either right because i might not be the best person or may not be the best person um and actually probably wouldn't be the you know the best thing for the client in terms of getting the end result and the objectives that they're, they're actually after it's interesting isn't it it is um, i think that diverse diversity kind of thing that you you mentioned is so just so fascinating i i, I just any any i talk about this book all the time if i'm honest like people that listen to this podcast are probably fed up of it but like it, it's so powerful and i think there's so much in what matthew syed talks about in rebel ideas that we as a profession need to acknowledge like it's i'm reading that book and i'm like and he's like, right, this is an example, and this is what went wrong, and this is why we shouldn't do it like that. And I'm like, we do that in the possession profession. And I won't go into them because I think we'll I think we'll probably touch on a few of them. But I think what what was interesting when I raised that question at that at that uh, conference 
and um and this lady she at the end of it she tapped me on her shoulder and she was like james i just i was really interested in what you said and i, and I just wanted to say that um my position my title is is well-being manager and i was like right that's interesting let's go get a coffee um and it's annoying because she gave me a business card because i was going to get her on the podcast to talk about it and i lost the business card and i can't for the life of me remember her name so god knows if she's listening and she's thinking that was me then she needs to message me but anyway and she was describing the setup of her team and basically her boss was was called the director of risk and he her boss i think she said was uh, more from an enterprise risk management so you know like the more kind of financial risk and brand risk side of things but they're yeah. given them underneath that health and safety as one of the risks so finance sat under the director of risk and as she was talking i'm like if i was to pick how to set up a business this is how like a big corporate business went for a redesign they come to james and they're like what do you think and i was like how we manage risk it needs to be risk like not just health and safety, I, I agree yeah I agree that um, so when we when we talk about things like when we're talking about risk in general health is part of that isn't it let's exactly. face it you know um we 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 do we talk about health and safety but most of the time when we're talking about health and safety we're talking about safety aren't safety, we yeah. yeah um and yeah health and safety and risk in general all of it you know hr it mm -hmm. you that is true how you build an organization but where does health and safety usually sit james where does it sit uh, frustrating to be honest it varies in my experience but f and what frustrates me the most is when health and safety sits under oh, my bloody dog i'm sorry if you heard that uh he's a nightmare when i'm upstairs he's really naughty when i'm downstairs he's actually quite good uh it's just a nightmare anyway fair um, babies in the interview is fine <laughs> god you just get used to it if i'm honest so I, i've given up trying to cut him out as well i'll just leave it in because it's just a nightmare um anyway where does it sit? What frustrates me? I think, I think it varies. I think where should it sit? I think it should sit under the, the one top person in that business. It should sit under the CEO or managing director, whatever you want to call it. Where I normally see it sitting varies between uh, director of HR or director of operations. I think if it's director of operations, it's a conflict of interest, in my opinion. This is this is a bit of a I'm a bit of a stick in the mud in this one. This is one this really ilks me. If I ever go to like a job interview and I say, "Where does the head of safety report to?" If they say director of operations, I'm not sure I want to work for that business. I think it's a conflict. It's a really interesting thing because I was talking to somebody yesterday about you know working with HR. So health and safety and HR work together, but sitting under also sitting under HR. If you're sitting under HR. You, you tend to be um, led in a slightly different direction. Mm -hmm. And I, so I agree with you that actually it should sit under the, you know, the, the person at the top, mm -hmm. um, but it can be really difficult to do that. And it, it tends to, nowadays, not so much, but 10 years ago, you used to see a lot of bolt on health and safety professionals. Mm -hmm. You know, I took a job once where it was an organization that had been around forever and they'd never had a health and safety manager. That still they gave happened. me a cupboard. Still I know. Happened. The amount of people that I get, like, because we do the podcast, we get a lot of people ring up and be like, are you looking for a job, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people and be like, it's a brand new role. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. This is 2020. This is a brand new role. Either this is, a, is this a really new company? And they're like, no, they're, they've, been, they've been going for years. And I'm like, what? How is that possible? Yeah. It's crazy. It, it, it is it is it is amazing isn't it and and it's it's still that kind of thing you know it hr commercial activity marketing health and safety they're all business processes when you start a business you still need them you know mm -hmm. if you start if you start at the beginning when you start the business and you have health and safety guess what you are in a better position as the business grows so okay if you've got one person write a policy get it sorted you don't actually need to uh, you don't actually need to write it down you know by, by you know by law but actually get it sorted because actually you still need to manage risk mm. you know it might be in your head but you still need to manage it and that risk is very much holistic isn't it you know you have to look after the physical and the psychological health of your employees that's what part of your duty of care isn't it that's you, what you have to do do you think the the duty of care lets us down a little bit when we if we talk about um so, so I, don't, I don't think I don't think let me caveat what I'm going to say first I don't think that legislation should be our main driver in doing what we do and I think there's I think which we'll touch on um there's a real benefit to managing 
our health and mental well-being of our business there's benefits that we'll get out of our people you know staff retention efficiency you know more present you know less presenteeism stuff like that which will, which i think we'll come on to but um if it's interesting that when i did my diploma um we were talking through it and even even the ncrq that i did they quite openly say in there that if you as a business and I checked it out and it looks like they're right. Obviously they're right. They wouldn't put it in a book if it weren't right. But it's um, if, as a business, you, you're really unlikely to receive criminal or civil litigation or conviction um, if you've got, for mental health, if you've got a reference, like a phone line, you know, like a mental health support line that has a reference system set up behind it. So I ring you up. Hey, Carla, I'm really struggling today. And you say, mm, you've rang me a few times, James. I'm going to bounce this over and it goes through some process that highlights it with the nhs or your gp or whatever um you have that you are compliant and this is one of my main arguments around being compliant but it's like i wonder whether the legislation needs a little bit of a of a of a revamp i think i think that and to caveat again i think the hsc guidance is very clear they they do a very good um manage the management standards by the hsc is quite good and they're quite clear on on the benefits of managing mental health within our business but when we're in a culture of compliance where businesses only do what they're told to do i feel like we're a little bit let down by the duty of care and the wow. legislation i don't know i shall tell you what i love that. I, I, think... I love it people disagree <laughs> with me that's good right so i tell you what i train a lot of senior managers and i have done ever since i started safety rock so i sit with managers at board level from all sorts of different companies so really high level organizations you know really not these are not small organizations they're very diverse so i work for whirlpool corporation i work for lockheed martin i do work with smith and nephew so many different companies and when you speak to those senior managers and you ask them what is most important the moral you know the legal or the financial side of health and safety they never say financial they never say financial sometimes they say legal because they're worried you know about being convicted you know worried about going to prison or you know getting a criminal conviction and you know what that's important but the majority of people that you speak to in the boardroom say moral Really? And they truly believe that, you know, so, um, so one of the things I have learned is that whether or not you train at low level or a high level in terms of staff or anywhere in between, that people are genuinely still people. So you could be the CEO of the biggest company in the world, but you're still a person. And nobody wants to see anybody flattened. Nobody wants to see anybody have a nervous breakdown. No, nobody really does want that to happen. Um, and so whilst I understand that compliance is an issue, and for some companies, they, that's all they care about, but for the majority of senior managers in really large organizations, they genuinely care. They genuinely do. I always say to people, the reason I do my job and I love health and safety and always have done is so people go home with all their bits and their mental sanity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they've got to come to work with it in the first place. You know, that's <laughs> <Yeah>. the idea. <laughs> work should enrich our lives. It should make us better. It should make us brilliant. We should love it. You know, love the job that you do. Um, but the majority of senior managers will say that they are morally, that's what they're interested in, you know, making sure that they keep their people safe. Mm. Can you imagine having to make the call to somebody? Um, and I've had to do it, not thankfully, not in this country. But when you make a call to somebody to say that their loved one has died. Mm. Nobody wants to do that. Mm -hmm. We are human beings after all, and we are human. Uh, and so even, you know, the most remote senior manager in the world still has to manage people. And sometimes people are challenging. We know that, but they are still people. And that's what makes the world go round. People make the world go round. So, you know, without them, as we've, pro as we've probably discussed, you know, as we've discussed, and uh, as we've all found out, our physical contact with people is so important. And whilst we're all still doing virtual calls and, you know, waving at people ac across the screen and all the rest of it, you know, and, and saying, we miss you, you know, actually what we'd like to see is people in the flesh. You know, so people are still all about people and, and anybody sitting in a boardroom of, of a FTSE 100 or a FTSE 200, 250 company, they still, um, they're still people. Um, and when you go around the room, I teach the, the NEBOSH and health and safety executive uh, 
health and safety leadership excellence course which was uh you know launched um mm -hmm. and that was um that is a course that is kind of um a balance between leadership training a bit of management training a little bit of psychology um and also health and safety all rolled into one and uh, when you teach that to senior managers uh, the questions that they ask are around the people aspects more than the criminal and, and you know the civil liabilities that they have mm. so um i do i do think that you'd be surprised at some of these big companies those people sitting in the boardroom do genuinely care now some people in the lower levels may go oh yeah they're just doing it because they want to cover themselves and all the rest of it and to a certain degree maybe 10 or 15 years ago you used to see quite a lot of that you see people walk in the room and some smaller companies definitely you have directors who will say actually i just want some compliance going on here but the larger organizations know that that you know that they need to care about their people because it is you know you're talking about productivity happy people are approximately 30 percent want that level of productivity you know um increase you know you'd want it wouldn't you you definitely mm. want to increase your productivity. It's like we go in and do those well-being days, you know, where we we do we do uh, like world war well-being. We go in and we do work with them, and we we do food plans and all the rest of it. People love it. They go away, they get healthier, they work more, uh, they're happier. You know, what company wouldn't want that? You know, staff that are happy and healthy. Um, I spoke to somebody yesterday, and he was saying that his wife has worked for a new organisation. He was just he was singing their praises about how brilliant they are at looking after their staff's health and their staff's safety. You know, that's what we want to hear, and they will attract the best talent and keep the best staff. If we're looking for a job, yeah, you you and I were looking for a job. Where would you want to go? To the company that looks after your health and safety, wouldn't mm. you? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's, it's that's interesting. Becomes becomes one of the attractive features about a job when you're looking for one. I, I agree. And I think, and I agree with everything. And, and I would say the data supports it as well. The evidence supports it. The data supports it that, you know, when you, when you, you look after your people, I always put it, I'm, I'm common as muck. So I always make it, I make it nice and common for my brain. And I always think back to when I'm a kid, um, when I was a little teenager and I was thinking, I've got my mates back because they've got my back. So I always say to senior leaders, if you have your employees back, they'll have your back. You know, work for you if you work for them. That that's what I think, and and I, and I, and I think it's interesting, and it's and it's nice to hear, if I'm honest. I'm always, I'm always happy when people disagree with me, because um, I can be quite pessimistic sometimes. Um, but and it's nice to hear that businesses are doing stuff like that. And I don't advocate to say that that that, that stuff doesn't happen. I can only talk from my experience, and maybe I've just worked with a load of bad businesses. I don't know. Um, but do you think that? and maybe this is not with your specifically with your clients because it sounds like you know like the well-being days it sounds like they really do kind of practice what they preach but there's, there's a diff i don't advocate to say that the board members are sitting in a boardroom saying we don't care about carla the machine manager or the machine operator i don't think they say that we don't really care if we kill someone or someone gets serious i think they do care but i feel like there's a disconnect there's a disconnect between that our actions kind of mimicking what we're saying and thinking. Yes, we care about you. I see it all the time, these businesses that say, you know, we, we, we care about our staff. We, you know, we do this kind of, you know, safety first promise or whatever you want to call it. But yet their actions don't mimic what they say in the boardroom. Again, it's quite interesting about how that gets filtered down. So sometimes you'll sit in the boardroom and then you'll speak to um, the senior managers and then they'll have all these actions that they've implemented. And sometimes they do get lost in the middle management. So mm. I know I've seen that previously. I worked in an organization where I went to tell the board something as the health and safety manager. And uh, one, of the se one of the kind of more senior middle managers said, you can't tell the board that you're like what do you mean well no they don't want to know that well yeah they do because they are the ones who are ultimately accountable mm. so you know um hiding things from the board that are actually fundamentally important in terms of safety and health uh, that just can't happen because mm. actually the 
the communication is important and I think it's all about you know you remember you did the four C's you know having competence and communication and all that kind of thing they're fundamental they still stick they still stand you know when you build a company you have to have really good communication so when a company grows and you have middle management levels sometimes those levels are the levels where you have the most resistance that's what I would say mm. and so um, the communication is going down as well as up um, and they and it gets lost at that middle management level so there's some work to be done in organizations we we talk about organizations and where they train people and how they inform people and what, what levels they kind of do it you know do they do it from the top down do they do it from the bottom up some companies do it different ways but it is far better to do it from the top down but give people mechanisms to be able to communicate with all levels of their staff and yeah, make yeah and yeah and all that kind of thing and going all the way back up and down within the organization capacity for people to complain capacity for people to celebrate the positive very yes. important to do that yeah whole range of different things and the same thing goes with health because health is such a much it's much more of a big problem isn't it than, than safety if you look at those numbers go back to those like um those numbers and say how many days people are having off it but it seems kind of almost uh, a mystical thing when we talk about health and our health it seems like something we're we're unable to achieve it's it, it but it actually is quite a positive concept isn't it mm. you know if we're healthy it's positive you know and um we yeah we definitely need to kind of think about as a prime importance in a company i always think this like if you're healthy um, and uh, you know in this current circumstance you might not have a job or you've been furloughed you're healthy you can still go and get another one okay you might be fruit picking for a few months or going to work in a supermarket but you're healthy there is nothing more important there is nothing more in terms of prime importance than your health because yeah. if you're not healthy you can't really do anything you can't you can't focus on the next thing you can't look to the future because actually you're focused on the here and now and the fact that you're not particularly very healthy and if employers are putting individuals into jobs which are actually affecting their fundamental health then they have a duty to do something to limit the impact of that job on the people on their, their staff on their employees health basically they have a duty to do something about it don't they mm it's yeah. really interesting it, it is genuinely interesting that it is a positive and dramatic concept when we talk about you know global health and we talk about you know uh, the picture of where we are in the UK um, and you know what you know what we need to do to address things um, there's some interesting things you know they talk about figures you know we're talking about recently talking about the number of people that are dying from things like um the coronavirus outbreak that you know that we're, we're having at the moment the pandemic that's sweeping across the world and that we've, we're actually at the moment um being faced with our own mortality do you not think we've like mm -hmm. kind of been faced with our own mortality um mm -hmm. more so than ever you know there's death figures on the news every single day and mm -hmm. you know and people are Thousands people are genuinely people. scared aren't they they're genuinely yeah. they're genuinely scared it's interesting um, actually that that well, because me, me and the white sorry i you i've in completely interrupted you and you were on like full right. flow then weren't you <laughs> that's a sign of a damn bad podcast guys like their guest is on a full-on good old and i'm just like stop talking this is about me this is my podcast <laughs> <laughs> um, love that <laughs> it's um it's interesting you, that, thank you um me and my my wife are quite uh i wouldn't say like passionate kind of environmentalist but but we we kind of we we definitely are on the left side of of being you know environmental supporters we we, we support it and we Every, every time we make a new decision, that's always one of our, our kind of drivers in making a decision. And, you know, so when I get my new car, that will be a key thing for me is like, can I make an improvement there? So that just kind of just uh, get, get some context around what I'm going to say, basically. And it's interesting that. Um, so so I went on my honeymoon too. And there, there, I will bring this. You're, you're like, why is he talking about an environment? And there is a point to this. I will bring it back to health. Don't you worry. Um, so I, I went to Australia, very lucky to go to Australia on my honeymoon with my wife and, and, and fill that, fulfill a, a dream of mine, which was dive in the coral reef, right? I went to dive in the coral reef. I knew the uh, environmental impact that we were having on the world was bad. And I've watched all the documentaries and, you know, I'm, I'm an emotional guy. I get emotional watching documentaries on the coral reef and chasing ice documentary made me cry. And oh God, anyway, so we went there and, 
it was in my face. The damage we'd done to the environment was there. Like the, I was imagining what you see on, on David Attenborough's kind of documentary, just like vivid reef of colors and fish everywhere. And it was just gray and pasty and stale and starchy. Oh. And it was horrible. It was in my face. And, and I went from being a, I'm going to, I'm going to think about the environment to coming back researching the shit out and literally will do everything I can to try and help the environment. It was in my face. It made a difference. And then we think about, I came home now where we'd been on holiday, where we'd been on our honeymoon two months later, it was now on fire. Like the whole of oh, Australia wow. was on fire and we we'd been to the blue mountains in Sydney and, and now that's been, that's scorched, right? People are starting to have this conversation about environment, but the, the people that I kind of debate with in my friend's circle and family circle still weren't buying into this environmental message, right? Because there's that perception, it's, I think, and I'm no psychologist or anything, but I think there's this perception that it's so far away. It's not going to touch us. And I think pre-coronavirus, that's where we were with health. Is this stuff won't affect us? You know, cancer, if it get, everyone gets cancer, you know, I'm just going to live my life and enjoy it. All of a sudden, we've got a virus that's in our face. It's killing people quick. It's spreading quick. It's right there. And look at how we reacted. When, once we realized how visual this was, the whole country took it seriously one give or take i i genuinely think that most people took it seriously i think the the media kind of skew that a little bit but that aside when he shut the schools i think that was a key thing and everyone was like this is serious so we started seeing death rates like you're saying it was in our face the exact same impact of me diving on the coral reef where that was that impact was in my face it was visual it was tangible i could literally touch it with my hands coronavirus has done that for our health we're now it in there it, we, we're saying we are vulnerable as a as a human species unless we look after ourselves so it is a, an unbelievable or a relevant concept usually to us mm. unless we are motivated and we're emotionally touched by it so if i think about the way we um the way we deal with things we are emotional beings you said you know you get emotional about things I'm you know so emotional. when yeah, when they shut the gym, like when you know, like when they said you can't go to the gym, I was still in the office on that particular Friday. They shut the gym before I got home from work. All my friends were texting me, "Want to go for one last hurrah?" <laughs> uh, no, can't actually. Uh, you know, can't get to the gym and all the rest of it. But on that evening, I literally just broke down and cried because I just mm -hmm. thought, "Wow, that's our whole life that we've just, you know, um, you know." just of all the things that would have an impact the gym upset, really yeah. had an impact yeah um and the reason being is it was about the perception of risk so for most of us the concept of our health is unbelievable and irrelevant to us it's like mm. a a mystical thing that's kind of there in the background that we like don't a roll of the dice isn't it you either got good health yeah. or bad health i'm either going to get cancer or i'm not going to get cancer blah 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 whatever yeah. i do is not going to impact me one dominoes that's not that bad is it except it's not one dominoes is it it's one dominoes and then another domino and another dominoes <laughs> If you're well, we were talking about food babies off air, weren't we? I mean, literally, I'm no, not being no, we funny. Weren't. Yeah, we. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Don't know what you're about. Yeah. Literally, um, when you think about the way people think about health, they think they can't do anything about it. They blame, blame their genetics. They go, "Oh, it's it's our genetics, our genetics." Mm. Yeah, you know. But actually, the 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 scientific evidence shows that seventy over seventy percent of all cancers are preventable via significant diet and lifestyle changes mm. you know uh, when we look at the numbers so this year around around 330,000 people in 2020 have died from SARS-CoV-2 you know the, the coronavirus COVID-19 disease mm -hmm. but actually 3.6 million people have died this year alone globally from coronary heart disease mm. So you look at those figures and you go, actually, we're being thrown all these figures on the news, you know, of, of coronavirus deaths each day. But how many people in the UK have died from coronary heart disease? How many people have died from diabetes? How many people have died from stroke? And how many people have died from suicide? You know, these mm -hmm, are the questions yeah. we should be asking. And often what we find is it's far more significant than the current pandemic situation. It doesn't mean that we're no, we don't care. It doesn't mean that we don't uh, care about the people that we love 
uh, we don't doesn't mean that we we're not we don't find it significant but it's what the media chooses to report isn't it rather than what is actually a, a very diverse uh, portfolio of information so if we provide people with information they've got an opportunity to process it and that's really what i tend to do when i'm teaching i give people mm. information so globally in the uk uh, globally um if, if we look at hepatitis for example hepatitis b there is no known cure for hepatitis b OK, um, I think a few years ago, you, you would see like 900,000 people every year die globally. Mm. You know, that's a huge number of people. But we're not talking about hepatitis. Um, we, you know, we're talking about something else. And it's it, it's almost like there are more viruses than stars. But all of a sudden, nobody realized any of them existed until we started to talk about coronavirus. Mm. And then it's like oh, people have had like a mass uh, cognitive awakening you know uh, that the actually bacteria and viruses exist beforehand they were sneezing all over the place and wiping it all over the tube you know now people are a bit more conscious some people are still sneezing all over the place and wiping it all over the tube but you know um, ultimately <laughs> ultimately um hygiene is so important we 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 we, we contract things we we contract things. the common cold often caused you know in over 50 percent of cases by the rhinovirus you know viruses are nothing new um, and they do have other impacts so we've seen, you know, in children, we've seen all these kind of extra things, these inflammatory, you know, post viral syndromes that we've seen in children. There's a whole range of different things that viruses cause, you know, but all of a sudden it's become really important to us. I have seen more people out on their bikes, running oh, no. um, yeah. out there than ever before. So we've, we've got two types of people, haven't we? We've got the people who are sitting there drinking gin, um, smoking 50 cigarettes a day and eating steak uh, every single day on the barbecue. Uh, and then we've got the others who are out there in their lycra cycling away um, because actually this has had an impact on them psychologically to improve their health. Um, and we must, we must as a nation, um, ride the wave of momentum and actually have some challenge, you know, have some conversations around what's important. Do we think it is the government's responsibility to look after our health? It isn't, is it really? Um, it's the government's responsibility to educate us yeah. and to uh, lead us, isn't it? But it's not the government's responsibility to organise gastric bands when we eat too much. Now, there will always be a time where people are ill and they all need support because they put on weight because of conditions. That's a whole different ball game. Yeah, I was but in the majority anything. of cases, yeah, in the majority of cases, that is not the case. Look, so people I, will always get conditions that you know will need support. Yeah, I think there's so much you, you've said there. Um, I think there's an interesting thing I think we've seen in coronavirus is how people see the government. And and when I we did like a we did a four week kind of special on the podcast of a panels and we had on the panel we had um, Jonathan Dempsey for Red Laces who kind of like this this like quite innovative risk expert he's he's got a really interesting way of looking at risk and then we had um, Christian who's like a like a cleanliness hygiene kind of geek um, is probably the best way to describe him. runs like a a floor slip uh, uh, safety kind of company but it's now kind of for well, actually, we can expand and take our clean cleanliness knowledge because obviously that's a big part of slip safety into the rest of the world. But then we 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 also had a, a psychotherapist who we've had on like six times in the podcast, um, and he was said he he was saying, "Oh, I was just on this other call, and and actually somebody said something really interesting um, that he was like, oh, David, which is the psychotherapist's name. We still live in a socialist society, and from a point of view in that." We think that the man will fix it. The man being the government, as a, as a phrase. I'm not saying only men would run the government, obviously. Um, but, you know, the phrase, the man will, will fix everything. The government will look after us. And we've seen that, haven't we? And that, that kind of, well, the government will tell us what to do. Um, we're not going to we're not gonna manage this risk ourselves. We're going to wait till the government tell us what to do, which is really interesting. Uh it is and it's really difficult to grasp as a safety professional so mm. when i had my meltdown when you know they shut the gym and shut everything gym, yeah. um at, at that point i was like this is completely disproportionate to the actual physical objective level of risk <laughs> and that is the risk manager in me coming out to the forefront this is yeah. what i'm talking i'm talking to myself and my other half i'm talking to him and he's like um you know what's wrong with you this is completely disproportionate <laughs> we are literally four in the gym you know um socially distance understanding hygiene i understand the routes of entry 
you know, I work for the Health Protection Agency. <laughs> you know, I understand how viruses get transmitted. I understand how things. So. Yeah. So this is the issue. Mm. Um, and uh, and then you look at you know other people taking you know li- giving their personal level of risk responsibility to the government. Mm. You know, um, is it you know fifty percent of adults, fifty percent of adults, around fifty percent of adults in the UK are on prescription medication. Mm. What? Why? You know, some of those things, we, we, they don't need to be on prescription medication because if they had dramatic lifestyle changes in terms of their diet and their exercise, a lot of those we could remove. Um, and and also, comes... there's, lo- yeah. Go on. That, well, there's loads of other things. There's loads of other things that happen when, you know, like when you give people prescription medication, they get all these side effects from things as well, don't mm. they? Yeah. And so that we end up having to treat all the side effects from the medication that people are taking With more as well. medication, which has more exactly. side effects. Which, uh, yeah, and it's a vicious cycle. And I think the problem with that, that, that actually, Carlo, is like, oh, something that, that just drives me insane. Like going to the GP and saying, right, something, like, I'll be up front. Right? I don't think I've said this on podcast. I'm not sure if I want to say it, right? <clears throat> right. Come, come on, on James. It's this. all right. We're well, not shy. <laughs> Authenticity on the podcast. I, I suffer with quite bad acid. Um, like for, for like the way, I, the way I describe it to my GP is like, come on, man. I'm only 29 and I'm like, yeah, I've got something that like, I'm taking tablets that my grandma takes who's like 70. Ameprazole. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, come on, give me a solution. This is not sustainable. That was my first, that was my other GP. I moved house and then I've obviously changed GP and this GP brought me in for a medication review. So I'm like, yes, yes, this is what I need. I want a conversation to tell me how to bloody fix this. Um, so I go in and anyway, she says, oh, we want to lower the amount of Ameprazole that you're on. So I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, perfect. What can I do to kind of make this better? And she was like, well, I just want to be clear as to why, why we want to take you down because oh, having this over too long can really start to affect your bones and you get with and i'm like yeah really badly yeah like why did, did he did not, not tell that? me that yeah no, he did I not know. tell me that i, I honestly I, I nearly lost my shit and um and i was just like I right know. you need to tell me so, so they cut me down great i'm still on them they cut me down and i was like you need to tell me what i need to do and it was the, and i'll get to my point which is a question to yourself but it it it, it was just a kind of generic crap, like cut out caffeine, right? Anything else? Well, if you cut out caffeine, that'll probably do it. So I'm, not, I'm like pretty much fully decaf now. That's, has it made any impact? None whatsoever. I've tried coming off the tablets. I get it straight away. Now, I will, I will caveat that by that. I'm not saying I, am a per, I don't have a perfect diet. I'm far from it. I could do better. But my point is, to your earlier point, the information is not there for us, Carla. Like we have to go and really find it. Like what is a good diet? And 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 I think we'll come back to the the Matthew Syed point of averages. But like we don't get that information. Like it's all over. Let's the place. be. I was going to say, let's be fair to GPs. They are under a lot of pressure. Yeah, you know, yeah, they are under a lot of pressure. You know, they have limited time and resources to see people. And so ha- discussing every contraindication of every, you know, piece of medication that they give you. I mean, also it lowers your stomach acid, you know, so therefore you're more likely to get infections in the lower intestines, the whole yeah, right. range stop, of different stop. things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, but the root cause, what's the root cause? So um, let, let's, let's act like a safety professional. What do we do well, when we investigate not, yeah. accidents? That's what I said root to him. Root causes, yeah. I said, my yeah. job is looking for a root cause. Can you tell me what yes. the root cause is? And he would <laughs> Oh, you must be a nightmare it. patient. <laughs> oh, it's, I'm terrible. I'm like, you're not telling, you're not giving me any information. My job, if you were working for me, and actually when this first happened, I was working for the NHS. And I was like, if I come in here and said, well, I'm going to shut this down because I've done a virus assessment, it's bad. You'd ask me why, wouldn't you? And he was like, of course I will. I'm like, and I'm asking you why you want to put me on these tablets. Well, because you get an acid. I know that. But give me some context is what I want. Anyway, you carry on. Well, yeah, that we'll take that offline. I'll talk to you about your acid later, <laughs> I think. But, um, uh, diets are really interesting, aren't they? Because uh, like, when we think about the diet industry in the UK, the more I think about what happens, the more I think it's led and designed to keep us coming back. Um, mm. And when, the more reading I do, uh, the more information I collate, the more data I see, uh, you know, with these fatty diets, you know, somebody was asking me yesterday about um, key, you know, ketosis and keto oh, diets yeah. and all this kind of thing. Um, so my view is, is that diets and when we talk about diets, we're talking about these short term fixes to try and make us lose weight. I think that's really what we're thinking about. It's not but about those, health, is it? It's about no. weight. Mm. 
it's about weight so we all put on a bit of weight don't we we all do it you know we we lose weight we gain weight that's part of being human um, and we moderate that you know that's the idea we always try and moderate it but diets in general are there to try and keep us coming back so we have to find things that fit but also have to think about the way we eat and the the way we're designed to eat so somebody asked me yesterday can you be a vegetarian and still eat healthily interesting question isn't it and the answer to that is yes of course you can I'm a vegetarian yeah you know you can of course you can get you can get everything you need you need to be very careful with things like a b12 you need to make sure you you have enough mm. b12 really important um but actually you you can find something that suits you and you have to find what suits your body type as well you know what you know you would have heard you know ectomorph you know mesomorph you talk about all these different mm. types of bodies so there's a whole range of different things how many calories do you need do you know do you know your basal metabolic rate do you know what you need just to breathe eat sleep no. and function no. you know that really important important you know people people talk about that and not all calories are equal as well if you get calories from coke is that going to be the same as getting calories from an apple i don't think it is Mm. because there'll be a whole range of micronutrients in an apple Mm. even though you've got sugar in an apple uh, it'd be very different in terms of concept to drinking a can of coke see what i mean so not all calories are equal so when we look at diets we have to find what suits us and i think in the future we are likely to see more personalized diet plans for people but yeah. but Sorry. if we think about diets in general no that's okay i was just letting you go so you can say that. thinking about diets in general genuinely we've got an opportunity to eat i think the best way to think about a diet is a life-changing activity not mm. a one month i'm gonna go on a cabbage soup diet for one month not a chance i'd never do those kind of things sustainable Just change yeah. isn't it? that's the point i've always said that even and i'm not sitting here advocating that i'm some kind i definitely don't have a six pack and not some crazy healthy guy i'm not but like these fad diets are just drive me insane and i just think it's not sustainable but it's, it's interesting a couple of things i want to touch on and i'm not sure which one to go with first um let's let's deal with what you were saying about the personalized diets because that's interesting what we you know be up front with everyone we we had a chat about this um a while ago and i read um the book that you mentioned earlier matthew matthew sides rebel ideas and he actually uses an example in that book to bring home the point around the danger of working in ad in averages and and he basically uses a survey and for life for me i can't remember what the survey is it, I'll find it in a book and I'll put it in the in the description below. Um, but it basically this this like research uh, process project that was in America and basically they were looking at diets. And long story short, they worked out that if everybody could go on what the government would deem as the healthiest diet, right? They pick the healthiest diet. Everyone go on it. It wouldn't work because James's healthiest diet is completely different from Carla's healthiest diet. And, and, and actually what we need is exactly what you said, which was personalized diet. So they've now ended up, they did this research, it blew the world up, even though I've never heard of it, but they blew the world up. And apparently this company now, their, their product or their service is you send us your, your doo-doos and your, and your wee-wees and all that stuff. We'll, we'll assess it and then we'll, we'll give you incremental changes and then we'll basically just over i don't know a six month period i'm I'm guessing here but over a few month period we'll adjust your diet to ultimately decide which foods you avoid and which foods you shouldn't avoid and and they're good for you etc and it becomes this this like fully holistic personal unique diet just for you I, i imagine it costs loads but you know that that just blew my mind when i read that yeah and i mean it's challenges amazing, isn't everything it? that we know doesn't it, it it's it gone it's literally just blows out of the water everything that we've that we've been taught in our life that meat and two veg you'll be good which yeah, is and, what we've been taught isn't it and it is and we have been taught that and, and and again i was talking to somebody yesterday about the whole thing um about three meals a day so when i was growing up i was taught that i had to eat three meals a day you know three meals a day that's what you do you don't snack you eat three meals a day mm. breakfast lunch and dinner however I, I was working one day and I was on um, on a safety bus and they were taking people's blood sugar level and I took had my blood sugar level taken and it must have been about 10 o'clock in the morning so I'd already eaten my breakfast and it was incredibly low and the nurse said to me you really do need to eat something now and I'm like no I don't eat <laughs> <I'm not laughs> doing. Um, and 
um, it just made me rethink things. It made me rethink because actually those dips, we don't want those dips, do we? Mm. So if we eat uh, small amounts more frequently, more often, that has an impact. For some of us, we are um, good in the morning and for some of us, we're good in the evening. So how we eat will be affected by our own personal body clock for example and mm. um, I try to eat no meals that are no 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 bigger than two of my two of my hands yeah, I got told that one yeah yeah you know um and that means that you know you're you're you're, you're evening out your blood sugar level um and so you eat five or six times a day now that sounds really difficult to achieve and I was like no way that you can't achieve that you can Easy. you can achieve it with some pre-planning um uh, also um the amount of nutrition so for some of us our brain works harder than others you know um you might need more b12 you might need more iron you know women might need more iron at certain points men need mm -hmm. certain you know things at certain points so you can't have a one size fits all um but there are some really key rules about you know eating very low down on the food chain uh avoiding processed foods that are overtly um rich in salts and sugar which you know our bodies you know it doesn't, it, it low, doesn't low down like on the that. low down on the food chain you would that examples of that would be just just a satisfying so mind less yeah. processed so more plant-based foods mm. so um you know if you're if you're cooking dinner you're not getting um a pre-packaged pre-processed meal from the local supermarket and sticking yeah. it in the microwave and eating that full of sugar usually highly processed preservatives and all the rest yeah. of it whereas if you buy um you know if you're, you're you're buying food and you're looking at increasing the levels of vegetables and fiber in your diet so fiber is not a very sexy thing to talk about is it but it's incredibly important um so getting enough fiber in your diet those kind of things but things like rice and different types of whole grains and mm. getting enough protein and calcium and you know all these kind of different things that we genuinely need but that, that is all very unique to each one of us mm. Um, and it's it's constantly adapting your diet to find the thing that works for you. I mean, I actually think nuts and seeds are really incredibly important. They genuinely have a lot of micronutrients that we don't often get elsewhere. Hmm. What do you think? Like, I want to uh, probably address. So, so you mentioned like more plant based food. So obviously that is a heated debate right now between the they don't even call themselves vegans anymore. They call themselves a plant based uh diet so um that that's kind of like the new the new vegan world and i and i'm hold my hands up i'm vegetarian um and when i did my research around that that was probably the, the thing that opened my eyes the most i watched all the documentaries on netflix and stuff which are quite eye-opening um and i think the argument could be made between they're picking the bits of data that supports their argument which everybody does so that's fine but i would be interested to kind of have that discussion about like in in your opinion there's that when i was born when i was born and raised it was everything in moderation um so it's now we've got everything in moderation um then you've got watch uh either what the health for example or um cowspiracy from an environmental point of view but and then there's another one forks over knives that's probably the most mind-blowing one there are three documentaries basically promoting veganism um and essentially they communicate the message that a meat-based diet kills you that's pretty yeah. much what they're saying. And now yeah. it is scary to watch. It is really scary. And it, you know what it made me think about is I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and say that that didn't, that didn't contribute to my decision. It, it most probably, but pretty much definitely did contribute to my decision to take meat out of my diet. Um, but it's in, I'd be interested to get kind of your opinion on that because I think the vegan society sit there and preach that this is this you're going to save your life here and this is everything we need but then the research that i've seen it would say our videos don't work so not everybody can go vegan and actually get on well with it exactly and i think this is the point so i am not vegan i don't eat huge quantities of meat though um, mm -hmm. but i'm not vegan um, or vegetarian and i think this is the thing it doesn't necessarily work for everybody so everybody has to find their own way one of the things i do think in the uk we have the the eat well plan we have the eat well kind of diet in the uk that is um is kind of publicized by the nhs that talks about you know having a balanced diet and having enough protein and you know all these kind of things in your diet and i think it's very important that we look at some kind of balance but one of the things about all of 
all of the statistics that people do use and we do we do people do use statistics for their own reasons but lies um, dumb lies and statistics as i say yeah i know but it is kind of those things you, so one of the things about having a vegetarian and a vegan diet you've got to be very careful that you don't lose really valuable nutrients mm -hmm. so there's things that are in meat that are really important um for starters, um, things like B12, it's really important. And it's really sometimes really difficult uh, to get it, that B12 replaced in a vegan or vegetarian diet. But it's so important because if you don't have enough B12, you can end up with pernicious anemia, which causes, um, well, all sorts of horrific central nervous system issues. So mm -hmm. um, really important. Um, and it's important that people go vegan for the right reason because it suits them. Um, but it's about trying to get as many different things into your diet as possible so it's not about eating somebody asked me yesterday about high fat diets you know all the different kind a lot of these are very fandy but it's about trying to get a balance so it's not about eating meat every day uh, okay think about the logic so we're cave people okay um when we're cave people we don't get to eat meat every day because we have to kill it ourselves mm -hmm. so we might have to four days a week just eat berries and nuts and seeds and you know the odd green bit mm -hmm. um and then one day a week or two days a week we go to get a, we, we kill something like a bison or something that's a big thing to kill isn't it but <laughs> we go and, and then we cut it up we put it we haven't got any freezer so you have to do a lot of stuffing of meat that particular day um and uh we get we get protein from that so um in terms of in terms of the way our bodies are designed, the idea with veganism is people are telling people that basically, um, if you eat meat, you're just basically killing yourself. But actually that doesn't necessarily work for everybody because they don't understand how to do veganism properly. Does that make sense? So no, if you're going to be sense. a vegan, yeah, you're going to really have to be really careful with what you eat. You so you can do veganism. You, yeah. you, you have to completely redesign how you look at food and I think you have to do that even if you just go vegetarian. Um, I, I got to a point, and similarly to your friend that you mentioned earlier, I got to a point I was eating worse food as a vegetarian than I was as a meat eater because I knew yeah. how to... I knew how to design meals around me and, and, and come up with ideas around meat, but I was just stereotypical, you know, meat eating bloke where I was like, it had to have meat on every dish, which, you know, it's, it's, it's contradictory to what you're saying. But my point is that you do have to completely redesign um, the way you look at stuff. And I think, a couple of you know experimenting with a couple of things you know we brought i brought a couple of books and um, we've got joe wick's veggie book jamie oliver's veggie book we looked on the internet a little bit more and we're just starting to like little things carla like just using fresh herbs like yeah oh, they make a oh difference my oh my god things like Life things change. like spices yeah. yeah spices herbs so you've got things like really amazing things like turmeric massive anti-inflammatory mm. properties in turmeric black pepper introducing cumin into your diet you know mm. some of these things are metabolism like cumin is a metabolism booster mm. you know in small quantities contains huge quantities of iron you know um so like stuff your herb, herb cupboard and your spices cupboard as full as you could possibly make it but it's understanding how to be a vegetarian not going i want to be a vegetarian so um you can be a vegetarian and be healthy but you need to be educated to be healthy mm being a vegetarian being a vegetarian isn't inherently healthy oh i'm going to eat vegetables all day i'm going to be healthy that's yeah. not true mm. you need to know how to do it and the same goes with being vegan um so you choose your personal choice what what suits you i mean i've had really high level discussions with people who are solely vegan and plant-based you know um and the conversations it's really tricky i mean i try to i try to in, in the and all the guides it says eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day but the scientific evidence says that that's not enough yeah. we need to eat more yeah. um and that we benefit from eating a really wide range of things you know from tomatoes to peppers to kale to you know sweet potato to carrots we benefit from all the the, the micronutrients in these things and the fiber that you know that's in them you know if you have a pear or an apple you're getting different you're getting different things but to try and eat that and eat everything else you need, that's quite a feat, you know, in a day to try and eat 10 portions of fruit and veg a day, you know, which is the kind of ideal range where we need to be looking at to have everything we need to function and all the rest of it. So it's a really interesting thing. So, yeah. yes, you can be a, you can be a vegan and be healthy. Yes, you can be a vegetarian and be healthy. And yes, you can be a meat eater and be healthy. Mm. Um, 
you know, look at fish. Fish often contains huge amounts of mercury. So you have to be really careful about how much fish you consume. So if you're eating like 15 cans of tuna a week, guess what? You might end up damaging your central nervous system. You know, um, it is um, it is really it is really about educating. I'm not sure. Did you do home economics when you were at school? I did, actually. Hey. yeah so I did too and and they used to teach us to cook and um, but what I'm quite surprised about is people's incapacity for cooking if you ask people what their repertoire is they will be pretty restricted come on usually it's spag spaghetti bolognese what can you cook spaghetti bolognese um oh, what, what can you cook what things can you cook James what is your oh, real well, repertoire in terms I'm, of I'm cooking? beans on toast <laughs> I worked in it well oh, right I, you just stereotyped me as a male like <laughs> And I find that very offensive. <laughs> no, you don't. Well, <laughs> Is it true? <laughs> no, I used to work in a pub as a chef, actually. So I'm, hey, I'm, I'm about to peel all over your bonfire. Um, hey, what, come on then, come on in. You tell oh, me what you can cook because it's can, really, it really is fascinating. My, my, what I can do is, is I can pretty much cook most things. What I'm not good at is timing. That's what my, my wife is so good at. So I could do a roast dinner, but it would never be as good as my wife's. But no, for other stuff, God, I could do, uh, we, we do a vegan chili, which I will admit is a Jamie Oliver recipe, but I could do it without even looking at the recipe. Now it's beautiful. That is a uh, Thai green curry, normal curry, uh, spag bowl, obviously normal meat based chili um loads of stuff uh beef wellington i've made um like when i was a meat eater obviously Just soups, it makes a difference stews, yeah the whole shebang yeah i could do that it we makes made a, a lovely what did we make a lovely we made two soups we had a, a spiced butternut squash soup uh, like two christmases ago oh it was just beautiful and then the following day we had so much leftover christmas it was like two or three years ago now we had so much leftover christmas food and so much leftover soup that we basically like blended up all of the christmas leftovers with the soup made a new soup oh we had like 20 bags of it gave it to my grandma she lived off it for like two years she loved it it was so <laughs> nice so nice um i i do want to uh however kind of like i'm sitting here and i'm thinking right who listens to this podcast it's health and safety professionals business owners business leaders business managers right they li they listen to this podcast so to kind of be like right yeah fair enough you're talking about diet should I? but you know this is the wrong podcast to be discussing that and to a point there would be like i think there would be probably fair enough for them to say what's it got to do with a business you know what i've got no legal um no legal duty really um that debatable um, but like no legal duty to help my employee eat better and actually it would be a nightmare for me to try and do that uh, politically socially politically um, you know why should I do this stuff Carla why should I even try to make my employees healthier when I've I've already got to try and run my business I've already got to focus on normal health and safety stuff I've got to do finance marketing etc do you get what I mean where I'm going with this yeah, and what I think is about we're thinking about the physical and psychological kind of help that we need to give our employee. We we have a duty of care to look after people's physical and psychological health and safety. Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about keeping people healthy, their jobs have an impact on that. And I'm going to give you a perfect example. So we uh, see a lady last year when we were doing um, some work uh, in an organization and she had really high blood pressure and she had uh, a really bad headache around her occipital bone at the back. And um, she was taking a variety of medications her blood pressure wasn't really going down it was really high it was something like 183 over 110 this, you know it's a huge huge amount in terms of blood pressure yeah you know, when you look at that um when you looked at her, you are, we questioned her with reference to her lifestyle and she worked 12 hour shifts in a call center and her job was sitting down yeah. all the time yeah. so when she ate she didn't get up from her desk um and what she ate came from the canteen okay so mm -hmm. um if you think about that she's in work so the effect of what the workplace is providing her and the work that she's doing is actually affecting her physical health 
Um, And that in itself was causing a major fear, probably not as much as she should be fearful, actually, having blood pressure quite so high. But then she's taking a plethora of medication provided by her GP with consequences. Like if you start taking blood pressure medication, you end up with acid reflux and often often have to end up taking... No, I know. (laughs) know, uh, know. Um, And actually, when we looked at the diets, you know, the timings, so, so the timings people are eating, they're not digesting their food properly. They're not eating it properly. They're eating at their desk. They're not leaving their desk. Do you see what I mean? So mm. employers can not necessarily go to people, you have to have a healthy diet, but you have to encourage people to eat healthily. So we, we, we have this, um, I started this brand called Nutrition Bites, which are small little pieces of information to give to people to help improve their nutrition. Like recently I posted something about try not eating after 7 p.m. Um, if you if you don't eat after 7 p.m. and before 6 a.m., um, it has a positive impact. Usually, if people mm-hmm. continue it for about two weeks, you can lose up to a pound a week. Well, no that's way. actually quite a lot of weight. Yeah. Um, so I always um, have a bit of chocolate about eight o'clock. Such a bad. Yeah, thing, you see. It? Yeah, it just well not for everybody, but it's just try it and see whether it works. So the idea is these little pieces of information, try them. If it works for you, it, if it works for you, if it doesn't, it doesn't. It's not like it's prescriptive. And so employees can do things. I've done like talks in the canteen with people. You know, why is breakfast so important? You know, breakfast like a king. What does that really mean? You know, eat loads of stuff at breakfast. If you're going to have a bowl of cereal, stick loads of fruit, nuts, seeds, mm. get as much nutrition as you can in. You know, grind some chia seeds in there, get some flaxseed in there as well you know there's there's loads of stuff that you can get and have a massive breakfast but when it comes to the evening don't eat so much so especially with you if you're suffering from acid you don't want to be eating late at night because actually that will exacerbate your problem especially whilst you're trying to sleep really there you go so, I'm trying yeah. it tonight i'll let you know yeah. how it goes D- don't uh, eat after updates seven, on the podcast him. people yeah Here updates on the podcast <laughs> james uh, so uh, you know and and things like um introducing certain things into your diet make a difference if it works for you it works for you if it doesn't it doesn't mm. as long as we don't actually cause any harm so when we introduce uh, prescription drugs to people we often cause harm whereas with food it's unlikely in somebody like for example turmeric turmeric's you know has anti-inflammatory qualities you usually have to consume it with black pepper otherwise your liver will kind of get rid of it you know and process it but actually you can have too much of some things but in order with food to have too much you need to eat a lot so Mm -hmm. usually food is not you know when we introduce food things they're not actually detrimental to people as long as people are eating balanced i don't really believe in everything is good in moderation so if somebody says to me mcdonald's is good in you know moderation or burger king or you know all those kind of other makes are available you know that kind of thing i don't think fast Um, food fits into that or whichever mcdonald's on a monday burger king on a tuesday kfc on a wednesday it's, it's a way of emotionally justifying it to ourselves oh i only have mcdonald's once a week it's absolutely fine and then <laughs> you look at people and they are they're growing day by day you know mm. because actually those things aren't good in moderation let's face it there's nothing moderate about having a large uh, large meal to take away that's not moderation is it when the chips are bigger than your head <laughs> <laughs> um it, the, the amount of food we consume in one sitting is quite interesting as well. So is it appropriate for us to sit and eat so much food that by the time we finish eating that we feel sick? No, it's got to not be. It's got to, that's got to be bad for you, isn't it? But there is something inherent in our kind of, maybe it's cultural, but like you, it, it, if you think about when I was a kid, it was, it, you know, it's, it's disrespectful to leave an, uh, food on your plate. Yeah. It was, yeah. you know, it might not be there next week you know i was raised by my not my mum but my my mum and my grandma but my grandma was raised during you know just so the tail end of the war so for her it was like rations and it was ingrained in our family now that you eat your dinner and you eat it all so that yeah don't be so mounds, ungrateful james yeah, yeah. exactly mounds <laughs> of food and i'm just like when i was a kid oh i could eat like a bloody like an elephant i'd just eat my dinner and everyone else's dinner and then dessert I can't do that now, but that ingrains in you, doesn't it? That like you have to finish it. But I think that's still something me and my wife struggle with now. We, we will clean a plate. My wife really struggles with that. Hates throwing stuff away. Yeah, and it is it is a cultural thing, and it's also the fact that we're human beings, and that mm. we've been, you know, you think we were hunter gatherers, so mm. you know we are 
genetic somewhere in our in our brains there's that whole thing is when are we going to get our next meal when are we going to get our next meal and so that is a we're fighting not only against culture of mass advertising and mass kind of forcing of glittery packets of chocolate and sweets and you know pre-packaged food that's convenient because we put it in the microwave for three minutes and it goes ping at the end and it's done you know we're fighting that aren't we as well as the desire that we have as humans to eat as much as possible because we don't know when we're going to get our next meal Mm. Um, and so it's almost like a partly like a losing battle but if we step back from it and say what do we actually need our bodies are machines what do we need how can we function you know do we want to for somebody to say to us how 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 can you how can you do that how have you got so much energy you know if we're going to live what's the average you know i I wrote it down earlier the the average life expectancy for women in the uk is 80 Uh, 80 actually it's 83 for women for men it's 80 so when you get you know when you're gonna yeah when you yeah when you get you don't want to live that long in unhealthy fashion do you really yeah I know, I think the brain is the big one for me. I, I can probably, I'd rather not, but I'd, I could probably deal with a physical ailment, but a mental ailment, oh, no way. I, I would yeah, hate you that. See? You want to live to and 80, food. but you want to live to 80 yeah. well, don't you? You don't want to, you don't want to survive to 80. That's You want to thrive to 80. So there's a lot of correlation between obesity and dementia. Yeah, no. So it just shows, you know, you know, obesity is a growing problem in the UK. Mm. You know, it really is. And there is a and and being overweight. Yeah. And there's a growing there's a growing uh, there's growing evidence to show that there's some link between obesity and dementia. You know, there is a link between obesity and having serious complications from having coronavirus. Mm. You know, we, we, we know that you've seen some of the people. I mean, I watched one guy on the news. I think he was 39. He'd been in hospital um, on a ventilator. Poor man really suffered. And he's he's sitting on TV being interviewed by Sky and we could, I could see him actually, you know, actually physically see him. And he was telling everybody how healthy he was, but he was 39 and he looked 50 and he was grossly overweight. Hmm. And when you look at that, he thinks he's healthy do we does somebody have to tell him that actually that isn't healthy um and that may be why um he has serious complications it may not be the only reason but it is a question that raises in my mind and i'm sure raises in yours as well about what we actually perceive to be healthy um and so companies can promote that can't they they and if they promote that they get more productive staff if they actually get people to be healthier more you know fitter uh, leaner they are their their brains work better they're less tired they sleep better they're more productive they they're likely to thank the company more if the company helps them you know the amount of the amount of people that come back to us we 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 would do sessions you know once every 6 months in some companies and they'll come back and they say i've completely changed my life you spent half an hour with me and I've done this, 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 I've lost two stone in weight. I'm now cycling 20 miles a day. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm happier, healthier than ever before. I've got a new, you know, a new girlfriend. I've got a new boyfriend, Mm -hmm. you know, this is the, and you know, I love that. That makes me feel so happy when I think we've changed some people's lives and the companies are happier because those people are happier and they're more productive. Mm -hmm. Amazing, isn't it? Um, It's all so interlinked, isn't it? Mm. so there is it's not just that moral side of like we should just do this to look after our staff because we're a good business obviously there's that's a that's a really nice thing to do i always i do and, and to kind of back that up i do think that like we as, as businesses are in a are in a powerful position to be able to have such a positive impact think how many businesses there are out in the, in the country just let's just focus on the uk just for now and you know we, we're we're all struggling. You know, the NHS and the, before coronavirus, the news was full of the mental health crisis that we're stuck in, right? But we're talking about, well, we need to give the NHS more money. Well, I've worked in the NHS and I've got a very controversial opinion on that, which I will not voice on this podcast. However, um, you know, we're talking about, let's give the NHS more money. We need to train GPs to be able to understand mental health. Yeah, we probably do need to do that stuff, 100%. But no one's saying, let's enable businesses to be able to man, man, manage mental health better because where do people spend most of their time? At, At work. work. So why are we not dealing with the root cause? We come back to our fundamental training, Carla, of what we were trained to do. Let's deal with it at the root cause. And I think if we did that with health as well, 
it's not only like this is a nice thing to do. We're helping the NHS with the mental health crisis. We're hemp- helping the NHS with the government or the world or our staff with an obesity crisis, whatever. Actually, there are benefits to this stuff because they'll work harder. They're, they're enabled to work harder. They want to work harder because they, they love working for you because you've looked after them. You know, they feel better and or they live longer and potentially work longer as well. Exactly. If they, if they to. Yeah. In, um, in, they, in a healthy state. Yeah, there's, there's, there's so much more to this than that moral side of things, isn't there? Like businesses will benefit from this. I go back to the employer's duty to look after their employees so far as reasonably practicable in terms of their health, safety and welfare. Mm. I go back to that. You know, the health is there. We have to look after our employees and little things make big differences to to the way people function. Mm. And companies that really do look after people's health as well as their safety tend to retain the best employees, tend to get the best employees. So they recruit the best employees and they often have the happiest work environment environments bearing in mind food diet lifestyle affects your mood it affects mm. your sleep patterns it affects your mental health Look, if you are your overweight work. and you yeah exactly if you're overweight and you look in the mirror and you don't like yourself you don't really want to go out and when you go to work you want to cover yourself up and be in a corner you don't want to be the person who's standing in the beginning of the room going hello everybody you know because actually you don't feel that good about yourself mm. whereas actually if you are healthy and happy guess what you don't mind standing at the top of that room and shouting from the rafters you don't mind being involved in stuff with other people because you're confident about the way you feel but also you've got energy so if you're not getting the right nutrients you're not getting anything that you need or you're not exercising properly because all of these things go in hand diet lifestyle it goes in hand you know or you're not sleeping properly because your you, your eating patterns don't fit your uh, you know your body clock or your circadian rhythm you know actually um it has a big impact so if we can encourage employers to you know do short sessions with on nutrition with their staff you know we, i'm not talking you know we're not talking that we're going in for like hours and hours and hours every every but the staff really appreciate it even the things mm. like about eating breakfast why do i need to eat breakfast why is it important well it kickstarts your metabolism you know you know all these kind of things and people make positive changes oh i feel so much better of a morning i used to feel so sick before i used to go to work now i started eating breakfast as i get up i actually feel better that's what you get from people mm. now for us as professionals fantastic i love hearing those stories but for companies they've got more productive people working for them mm. happier healthier and those small changes over a longer period of time can have really big impacts as you said you know less days off if you know mm. think about go back to the numbers go back to the 28.5 million working days lost each year and most of them are to do with work related ill health you know if you if you have a weakened immune system because you don't get the nutrition you need guess what you're going to be off work more because you're going to contract all manner of things because you actually haven't you haven't been looking after your own body Mm. so companies can help i think as well we would start and i've got no data or evidence to back this up but just be my opinion i think that we would we would also start to see improvements in our other risks so I'm, i'm thinking you know uh, uh we all do dse assessments and we write loads and loads of paper and we we probably get companies like uh posture right they come to i've worked with them a few times they come to my mind we get company like that they come in and they give you the lumbar cushions and they, there's there's just 800 pound chair well that's probably quite a cheap chair actually from companies like that i've seen i think a boss of mine once had like a three grand chair which is like this full-on ergonomic thing e- everything moved like literally everything on the chair moved um so had all of that but it's like well i'm not being funny but you, you're still obese so no matter how many chairs i get you how many lumbar supports get you you need to lose some weight and that's really hard for me to have that conversation so if we as a business are creating or not so much having those horrible conversations to say you need to lose some weight what we're doing instead is facilitating the environment to enable someone to make that decision themselves then surely we start to see staff that are more alert, which is what we as safety professionals want. We want our staff to be switching on to risk. We want them to be alert. We want them to be comfortable at their desk. We want them to be mentally comfortable. All this stuff is just kind of like the collateral positives or the residual positives of just having a good diet. So I think there is so much good that that can come from a business kind of facilitating this. 
and the exercise as well it's holistic it very much is holistic and the safety aspect you're right so less fatigue um you know yeah. longer work you know we work quite a lot of hours in the uk so less fatigue less uh, less capacity for human error we're always talking about human error well if you don't eat properly and your blood sugar, blood sugar levels all over the place guess what you're more likely to make a mistake that is fatal or causes a significant injury to yourself or others mm -hmm. so all of it is interlinked and i genuinely think that 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 health in health and safety has been missed and it's not all about mental health it's actually far greater than that don't get me wrong mental health is really important but a lot of people have got on, on the bandwagon over the last few years of just talking about mental health but your mental health is also affected by how you feel yeah. um, and how you feel is affected by how much you exercise and how what your diet is it really well, is i mean it's the basis of everything isn't it yeah, and I think I mean, physical exercise is one of the main things that anyone that advocates a mental health message will tell you, you you've got to exercise because that releases endorphins, which sets you off for the day. When I used to gym in the morning, God, I was like the happiest person in the world because I release all of those endorphins in the morning before I've even started work. And, and it's like, done, done. I'm, I'm full of endorphins, ready for the day. I was, I was cheery as hell. Um, now I just can't get my ass out of bed. That's probably because I haven't got a good enough diet, Kyla. I know that's what you're going to say. You don't have to I'm say. I'm going to have it. to have a word. <laughs> yeah, I'm it concerned about really, it. It's really, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, and how we can fit that into organisations? Well, it's giving quick hints and tips, uh, giving their yeah. staff a little bits of information that improve their lives. Um, having a Q and A, so having having a general, you know, Q and A sessions within organisations with staff. You know, some people are not interested. They're never going to be interested um, unless it has some motivational, you know, um, impact on them. Others will lap it up and change. You know, um, you know, we see so many people who've made such significant changes who come back who are happier healthier and organizations are happy because they've got happy staff it is mm. it is it is the basis of everything i go back to the thing about you know you know if you're healthy and you don't have a job you can you always get you know you can always get a job if you've got a job and you're not healthy well actually can you continue to do it you know mm. you know and that's and that's the thing about what's important what's the motivation burying our heads in the sand and then having a heart attack at 50 is not it's not brilliant coronary heart disease is a, the one of the it's it well, it is the biggest killer globally you know followed swiftly by stroke you know mm. um and um these a lot of these things are preventable you know um you know we blame genetics again but we we have a capacity to prevent it so things that we do every day and people go oh, i don't have the time to exercise and i you know i don't have the the, the you know the time to cook food or all those kind of things but there are, are there times where we all don't have the time to do those things but it's about trying to fit it in our lives you know you know how you feel when you've had a nice walk or done a 20 mile run or 20 mile cycle you know you feel better oh, yeah. you know and it helps us you know i said to you about the whole having a meltdown because of the gym shot that's my that was my you know that was my place to be still and quiet and just mm. have my time to just you know manage everything that goes on in the day so, so what i think it does as well is it is for me anyway and i think you know i don't advocate to be perfect and maybe you'll disagree with this but it'd be an interesting well then you're perfect uh, james no yes you, you should disagree <laughs> with that no i mean okay. you disagree I, what i'm saying i'm saying i'm not perfect and, Oops, and, stuttering. <laughs> um right let me get this out right what i'm trying to say is come on james use your words use your words is is for me is if i if i'm eating well in the week for example let's say monday to friday i had a really good week i've eaten I've eat well breakfast good lunch good dinner good i've i've been on a couple of bike rides and i'm going on a couple of long bike rides at the weekend or i've been to the gym or whatever you do for exercise but you've eaten well right and then you've got like say a party on a friday night on a mate's house you know you're gonna have a few beers or a few gins or or whatever um what you don't get after that is that guilt from saying oh i've just i ate so bad tonight it was a beige buffet and i love beige buffet or i'm a sucker for a beige buffet and i had six pints of doom bar or whatever what you don't get in the morning i think is is that guilt to say oh you know i've just i've just kind of i feel so bad i've i've, I've, I've uh, you know i've ruined everything you're like well actually i was really good in a week so I've, I've enabled myself that room to be a little bit naughty and i feel like you're going to disagree and say you should just never touch a beige buffet and never drink alcohol maybe i've misunderstood mm. but no I, I mean don't get me wrong I, I don't advocate doing it once a week 
No. That's sure. Yeah. Oh, so, crap. Um, yeah, sorry. Like 10 pints of Doom Bar once a week is not going to do you anything. Well, it tends a bit much. No. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, you, you know, the old ch- you know chocolate bar, the old burger. It's not going to do you know. It's not going to be the end of the world. But it's about that consistently trying to get. You think about your body as being a machine. So you need to have exercise. You need to have all the things that you need. If you go and you know pickle yourself with lots of alcohol every single week, everybody knows that's going to have an impact at some point. And you you know um, that's the thing to think about. So yeah, go off and have the old blast out. But it is that whole kind of thing about how often you actually do it. If mm-hmm. the rest of your diet is genuinely uh, balanced and also broad, so like as in there's a real broad scope in there. Because I genuinely think that a lot of it is about making sure that you do eat a very broad diet. You know, like you literally you don't eat you know the same thing every single day of the week. Um, and you know if you think that you've you kind of um you know lost out on a few days you know you try and make it up elsewhere but yeah i mean we we're, we're human we, we we like to you know do certain things one thing i would say though is really interesting is that the more you eat a healthier type diet the less likely you are to want to go for sweet things so and and more salty things so for example if you have lots of sweetener, so you, you re- remove sugar from your diet and replace it with sweetener, you're still addicted to the sweet taste. Mm. Um, so actually, you're not really getting it's away from the fact that you like sweet stuff. Yeah. Whereas if you start to eliminate that from your diet um, and try to replace it with things like more fruit and stuff rather than chocolate bars and donuts, um, your taste for sweet changes. So when somebody gives you a donut, you go, oh, this is way too sweet for me. Um, Whereas if you just replace everything with artificial sweeteners, then you're still addicted to that sweet taste. And the same thing goes with salt. So if you are still kind of supplementing it with kind of salt that's like low sodium stuff, you're still addicted to the taste of salt. So Mm. you don't really get away from things. Whereas if you kind of slowly remove salt and start adding spices, like, you know, we were talking about, you know, cumin and turmeric and all of these cool things that you add to your, and herbs, you know, there's a variety of different herbs. Some of them are really useful. Um, And, you know, if you if you flavor things like that, you become you you tend to start to like healthier things. Does it make sense? You you yeah. genuinely start to like. You know, there there are ways. You know, there was there's this study that shows that if you eat a burger, um, and you eat a burger on its own within a short period of time, your arteries harden. Whereas if you eat a burger and you eat a burger with um, and I'm talking about beef burger here, um, you eat a beef burger with avocado there is something called linoic acid in avocados. And um, I read a study that said that if you eat a burger and avocado together, the level of artery hardening after eating it is significantly reduced. No way. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So there are so many interactions that we have with reference to food. Um, And what I said to you at the beginning about not all calories are equal. So having, you know, people calorie counting, you know it's, it's nice to know how, how many calories you need to function but if you're eating all those calories from candy bars and coke cans and all the rest of it and you know sweeten overtly sweetened drinks and foods and all the rest of it that's very different from eating fruit and vegetables and you know all those kind of other things um, even if you're having a smoothie and all the rest of it it's very different calories to that you know the overly processed food mm. it doesn't mean you can go and drink like 15 pints of smoothie because that's what people were doing at some point you know they were going and buying you know smoothies. big old bottle of smoothie and actually they don't advocate you have any more than sort of 250 mil a, a day really because mm. um it's broken down so your body's basically the, you just the sugars change around. don't they the, the, or something yeah it, it gets absorbed into your system far quicker because you're not breaking the fibrous it's already done for you isn't it so um you know and that's a huge amount yeah just everything in moderation no no not everything (laughs) not doom bar (laughs) i go for a long bike ride when i'm coming back like i crave a smoothie we we buy like little smoothie bags from tesco or whatever like other other i've always wanted to say this other supermarkets are available yeah um, you see i said that about the restaurants <laughs> yeah <laughs> um it doesn't matter if i don't think for podcasts because yeah, so the bbc have to do it for legal we don't anyway anyway my, my point is i buy like these little these little like smoothie bags and they're just the fruits in them and all you have to do is add like apple juice or something depends what it says oh my god so good 
and it got to tell me it tells me something that i crave that when i get back from like a long bike ride if i'm doing like a 20 miler 30 miler i don't know 35 is the longest i've done so far so i go do i did 35 at the weekend when i got back and all i could think was i need to get that blender going right i was craving like goodness and an instant kind of hit from that from that kind of broken down sugar but I, I wasn't craving like chocolate or anything like that i wanted and i'm a chocolate holic so for me to say that is is something you know i was craving goodness i wanted i wanted fruit i didn't want anything bad that's got to tell you something hasn't it well, it's interesting what you say about chocolate because actually chocolate and like things that people are starting to add things like raw uh, cacao into their smoothies and you know um there's quite a lot of protein uh, there's lots of magnesium in some mm. of these things which are kind of important so you can add powders and stuff to your uh smoothies to improve the nutritional value mm. um to get some more fat you can add you know milled chia seeds or yeah, linseed yeah. and there's a whole range a of people don't know about kale in there though, do they yeah yeah well, one of mine's got kale in it actually yeah kale is good it's one of the most nutritionally dense foods on the planet yeah. well, and yeah, it's so. so easy as well you can just chuck it in anything really like yeah. if, as, as long as you're not too funny about the the texture i think it gets some some bits get a bit crunchy but you can chuck it in anything nut anyway. butter you can add nut butter in there so yeah so if we teach people this that people come people like this stuff you know because mm. it's not like it's not like you, you know you know that whole kind of traditional safety when you walk in the room and you get the sideways look i mean there was one guy once i did yes, a I training that, right? session yeah you know the look don't you yes. i did a training session for contractor management and he didn't talk to me all day and at the end i said oh, was that all right and he goes yeah i was expecting a battle axe that's what he said to me all day no way. and i was like oh um okay he goes Sorry. no it's fine you weren't <laughs> <laughs> should i have been a battle axe i don't know <laughs> but um nutrition is something people want to talk about that you know they're interested in it whereas you know um safety you have to you're almost on the back foot you have to kind of win people over um mm. and i do that because i'm passionate i love safety you know like cut me in half it says safety rocks all the way through the middle you know i love it but actually health is something that people do want to talk about and now with the pandemic even more so james even more so people are now going oh i might need to look after myself a bit more yeah it's true mm. nobody else's responsibility nobody else is going to uh, do you think yeah. we'll see a change in people i think i can see there's definitely more people running is definitely there's de way more people on their bikes like it's annoying if i'm honest quite like the the, the quiet roads but it's just there's cyclists everywhere i've never been overtaken on my bike never never been overtaken. i've been overtaken three times the last two weekends like i'm like what's it's going a on? doom bar and the steak isn't it that's what's Probably doing it, it. Every well, time. it's not the steak being vegetarian it's like a massive like Domino's veggie pizza probably but no, I won't <laughs> say I've definitely dropped my average speed definitely but but my point is like there is much more and we, we are coming in cycling season so you know the real cyclists are starting to come out now you can tell by the by the by the gear and the equipment but that aside there's so many more people that are out on the on the bikes nowadays there's so many more people um exercising so i feel like it's made a difference but do you think this has made and we'll probably finish on this point but do you think it's made a sustainable difference in people's way they think about health coronavirus i, I think mean? in the short to medium term yeah so what i mean is by we've been all been faced with our own mortality mm. um before this most people didn't think you know that they 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 didn't consciously in their conscious brain they weren't thinking oh i might die yeah. or you know i may die and now they are so they're looking at all the facts and figures and people saying you know men are you know more greatly affected by um serious complications associated with contracting um coronavirus um if you're obese I didn't know that. Um, yeah yeah <laughs> unfortunately. i miss that one yeah um uh, <laughs> it's an unfortunate thing you know and, and there is a reason i think i think oh. if you looked at the logic around it men traditionally and this is not the same for everybody, but as men age, they tend to look after themselves in terms of their health less than women do. Um, and, and that's a, a generalization, but it's ba based on data. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas when men are younger, they tend to look after themselves better than women do. And then at some point in their late 20s, it tends to change over. Fascinating. I love stuff like it, that. It, it, 
It is, yeah. Um, and the other thing is when people are obese um, and they ha have diabetes, they're more affected by serious complications. And obviously yeah. we do have high levels of type 2 diabetes in the UK and high levels of people that are actually genuinely overweight. I mean, I, the amount of people that say to me, oh, I'm, oh, the doctor says I'm obese, but I'm not. Mm. OK, how does that work then? Yeah, the doctor says I'm obese, but, but actually I'm not. And you look at them and you think, well, actually you are. You know, and you, you might you or you may have convinced yourself that you're not, but you are. And I think the human brain is really interesting what we justify to ourselves about the way we are. You know, the GP says you're obese. You probably are. <laughs> you know, um, it, it is um, they, they're not going to just say it just because they want to insult you that day. <laughs> uh, they're not going out just to, you know, to drop your confidence. And, you know, you walk out, they go, no, the GP says I'm obese, but I'm not. <laughs> kind of. um, it is um, it is genuinely uh, it is genuinely going to be sustained in the in the short to medium term in the long term I really don't know um, mm. we have a drop off in the um, life expectancy for the first kind of time don't we um, yeah and then you've got so, that kind of like you know, it, it's the same in like any kind of major incident in health and safety you know there's a, there's a corporate and social memory um, you know, look, look, Grenfell is a prime example. You know, I, I've, I've mentioned Grenfell all the time because I will not, I will not let the message die of, of, of that, that tragedy. But no, I'm not talking about it anymore. We've got a new tragedy to deal with now. It's called coronavirus. It's literally, I think it's a worse timing, you know. But even before that, what has it been, four years now, I think, which just is crazy because it feels like yesterday I was watching that on the news. But it's like four years and businesses have forgotten about it. And there's that, there's that corporate and social memory. And I wonder how long this one will last. How long will we really remember that our mortality was, was, in, our, was in our face and it was tangible and it was right there? You are right. Organisational memory is so important and, and cultural memory. I think this will have a, a, a bigger impact on our, on our children. So on the young children, it will have a, a lasting impact. Uh, uh, on adults, they would have seen things beforehand. But on children, I think it will have a, a, a long-term impact. Um, mm. But we will see. Um, but short to medium term, I think people will think about their health more. I hope that we can ride the wave and keep promoting that health, me health message. That's really what I'd like to do is make sure that people realise that actually their health does really rock. Well, that what a great point to to kind of end the podcast. That was flawless. Did you plan that? No, that was amazing. But it, it, well done. It did genuinely look like I did, didn't it? <laughs> oh, so that Thank was you, just James. so perfect. Right. So on that note, then, what is Health Rocks? How are you going to ride the wave? How, if people like what you're saying, how do they get hold of you for both Health Rocks and Safety Rocks as well? Uh, so they can get hold of me at info at safetyrocks.co.uk. Um, and in terms of riding the wave, we can help organisations improve their employee health and also their employee safety. Uh, so, yes, uh, you can get hold of us and you can find me on LinkedIn as well. I'm on, on LinkedIn as Carla, uh, Carla Crocombe um, and you can find me there. My surname is spelled C-R-O-C-O-M-B-E. Very important because most people don't even know how to say it like, rather than just spell it. I didn't. I didn't you, <laughs> yeah. you called me out there. I'll admit I had no idea how to pronounce <laughs> it. And that's why we checked before we press record. Um, Brilliant. I'll, I'll link all of that stuff in the description for everyone as well. Uh, Carla, that was, uh, for me, a very interesting conversation, which is what I enjoy. I just love people that can just chat about a subject and get real into it. But I think we talked about a lot of stuff there. And I think, I think it's, um, I think it's really important to, for businesses, maybe like you say, to take a step back and look at, with a wider kind of impact that we can have here and it can be positive Let, let's to use your words let's ride that wave which i thought was really nice thank you very yeah, much for coming on the podcast that's brilliant thank you james thank you for having me okay guys i hope you enjoyed that conversation like ugh, just awesome isn't it I, lo I love just carla can just like have such one of those people that can have such a good conversation um you know it, it just that's what I love about this podcast, man. I just love talking to people. And Carla's one of those people that she's so passionate about this subject that you can just have a damn good conversation about. And she's so knowledgeable on it as well. Like some of the stuff she's been banging out of statistics and, and like what this herb can do for you and nuts and seeds of this and that. And, you know, and then she backs it up with those stories of where, where she's been, you know, working with her clients and her well-being days as well. It's just a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, 
Let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube, you know, whether you're going to change anything with your health, whether you've had a different perspective on health after coronavirus and, you know, what that is. Let's have a conversation around it. Let's all be open and honest uh, with each other and, uh, and help each other grow. Um, if you're not on YouTube, once you get back and you're feeling a little bit bored, you can come on LinkedIn, Rebranding Safety, or Facebook at Rebranding Safety, or Twitter, Safety Rebranded, and come and have a chinwag with us. And we should all chat about health, our health, because that's a good thing to talk about. Next week in the mini series of our health and wellbeing mini series is the amazing Mr. Paul Clark, sales warrior turned spiritual warrior, as I like to coin the phrase around this gentleman. You know, we had him on the podcast a while ago in our little mini series, our first ever mini series it was actually, called Breaking the Plateau, where he'd come on and he talked about how he's trying to build this kind of innovative event, um, which we did a vlog of. You can go check that out on YouTube, the HSC Congress in the UK. Um, but anyway, it's not about that. He's now, you know, found. He's, he's had, you know, some really challenging background. I don't want to spoil it. He's had a really challenging background. He struggled with addiction. And now he's kind of, you know, found a spiritual way out of things. And I just think it's really interesting. And I just like the kind of way he, he approaches this stuff. And he's really honest when he says, you know, it's, it, people aren't going to, you know, go and start preaching Buddha tomorrow. Um, but but if there are things that people can take away from it. So it was just a really good conversation. You go check that out. I go, go check it out. It's next week. You're gonna have to wait till next week. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. What's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Go buy some merch, people, please, because like it's just friggin' awesome. I've got merch. I mean, come on, that's nuts. www.rebrandingsafety.com. Go get yourself some merch. Get yourself a sweatshirt, t-shirt, mug, tote bag. It's all safe it's as sound, safe as shit, as I like to call it. Um, it looks good, reasonably priced. You know, great quality as well, great quality. Made by a lovely lady local to me. I've known her for a long time, used to work with her actually. Um, go check it out, www.rebrandsafety.com. If you get any, all those social medias I said earlier, LinkedIn, Facebook, Rebrand Safety, Twitter, Safety Rebranded, take a selfie, tweet us, LinkedIn us. They need to come up with like a tweet thing, don't they, for the LinkedIn, like linked us and face us. No, that doesn't work. Anyway, I'll catch you later in the next week's podcast of the mini-series of Health and Wellbeing, where we talk to Mr. Paul Clark all about our spiritual, mental well-being. Catch you later. Safe.